So for this week's Challenge Wednesday, we have our patient Tammy. And Tammy underwent a right transtibial amputation several weeks ago and is participating in therapy for balance and gait training during initial contact to loading response. The patient has excessive knee extension. Which of the following is the most likely cause of the deviation? So we have A, uh, gluteus medius weakness. B is knee flexion contracture. C is inadequate socket flexion. And D is the hip flexion contracture. Go ahead and lock in those answers, y'all. We got to see it. All right. So let me come up to the top here. Get my marker going. There it is. There it is, y'all. So first things we got to look at, Tammy underwent this right transtibial amputation several weeks ago. All right, cool. So one of the things you got to be ready for on the MPTE is the transtibial amputation. It is the nemesis to a lot of you. I know you have to understand transtibial amputation. Obviously, it's below the knee. All right. She had hers several weeks ago and is now participating in therapy for balance and gait training. So all that makes sense to us. Right. I mean, she's lost a part of her limb, her right limb. And now she's coming to us for balance and gait training, um, typically. They're going to be using some level of prosthesis, right? So all that makes sense. There's not a lot of magic that we have to do there. So it says during initial contact to loading response, the patient has excessive knee extension. Which of the following is the most likely cause of this gait deviation? Let me read that again. So during initial contact to loading response. So let's slow up there for a moment. We know that now they're telling us a little bit about the, the phases of gait here, the specific phase, um, it's specific timing of gait. They're talking about initial contact. That's where the heel is supposed to be striking the ground. Loading response where we're accepting weight onto that lower extremity. So during this part, of the gait cycle, the patient is having excessive knee extension. Well, here's the deal. Is excessive knee extension normal? And before I really even ask that question to myself during the exam, I'm asking myself, well, hold on, Kyle. What is normal to begin with? All right, what is normal? What's supposed to be happening? And you should be saying, well, during initial contact to loading response, at least at the knee, I should see that the knee goes into more flexion. The quadriceps are eccentrically controlling our body weight as it moves into knee flexion, all right, as the knee moves into knee flexion. So should we see excessive knee extension? No. So what is potentially our problem here? What is potentially the reason for the deviation? That's the bottom line question I'm trying to answer here. All right, so let's go ahead and look down at our answer choices now that we simplified things. And our first answer is A, gluteus medius weakness. All right, so let's think about that for a moment. Gluteus medius weakness. Hmm. Now, are we not talking about a muscle that's up at the hip right now? Right? Are we not talking about an abductor right now? That's what the gluteus medius is in charge of, is abduction of the hip. And so if they're weak, if the patient's weak, we know that they're going to have difficulty with what? Hip abduction, Right? Now, when do we tend to see gait deviations? I mean, when, what type of gait deviations would you see with a patient who has gluteus medius weakness? That's really a question we got to start asking ourselves. And so I saw in some of the answers earlier, people were saying things like Trendelenburg, and that's exactly right. My question to you is, when do I primarily see Trendelenburg? Like what part? Do I see it in, in initial contact, loading response, or in between there? Do I see it in terminal stance? Do I see it in mid-swing? Do I see it in mid-stance? Like, where do I see that? That is the important information I need you to recall right now. All right? And so we tend to see that problem in mid-stance. That whole Trendelenburg and where the gluteus medius is really important is actually during mid-stance. That's not even what this question is asking me about. So I don't like A for that reason. I also don't like A because... Gluteus medius controls like frontal plane motion, right? Y'all remember the planes back from kinesiology class, right? Frontal plane, sagittal plane, got your transverse plane, right? Well, gluteus medius is controlling the transverse plane. It's not even controlling the, the sagittal plane. And that's what we're talking about in this question. We're talking about a sagittal plane problem. Knee extension and flexion is a sagittal plane problem, not a frontal plane. So that's another reason why I'm like, mm, 
probably not A. I don't like it. Does that make sense, y'all? All right. So let me go ahead. Mark A out for now. Let's go down to B. B says knee flexion contraction. <laughs> ah, I see what the tester was trying to do here. Knee flexion contraction. All right. So here's the deal. If the patient has a knee flexion contracture, how the heck are they getting into uh, excessive knee extension? Y'all tell me that. If the knee, if the knee is in a contracted position, it's in flexion. How are they getting excessive knee extension? It just can't happen. It just doesn't make sense. So the tester right here was just trying to throw in one of those distractor answer choices. And we can go ahead and eliminate B. It just doesn't make sense for this question. All right. Y'all following me? Everybody getting that? All right. So let's look at C. C says inadequate socket flexion. Oh, all right. One of these special terms now. Socket flexion. Hmm. So we need to really pull off to the side, even if you have to use your laminate paper, draw it out for yourself and try to make sense of it. All right. The socket is really what your patient's limb is fitting into. Right. And then you have the actual like prosthetic unit, which comes down here. And then you have the actual foot, right? The prosthetic foot. Now, the thing says inadequate socket flexion. The first thing you got to know is <laughs> really what is socket flexion? I mean, this is one of the things I never truly understood in PT school. I never really got a grasp of this. Luckily, I had a CI that taught me all this. This drawing that I'm about to do for y'all now is the exact drawing that they taught me. All right. So hold on a minute. Now, let me erase that for a second. Let me make sure we're all on the same page. All right. So y'all see how that socket now is is at a different angle y'all see that right how it's tilted like that okay so here's the deal this is actually called socket flexion right here you see it's kind of tilted this is the front of the body by the way this is anterior all right and this is posterior back here for this one so you can see how that socket is tilted as if it looks like it's tilted forward or something right okay that's known as socket flexion, y'all. Don't forget it. And normal socket flexion is supposed to be about five to eight degrees of socket flexion. Now, what I never really understood, and I got to draw this out for you too. Hold on a minute. We're going to draw the limb as actually being red, okay? And so, see, the limb has to fit into the socket. So let me show you a little something. The limb fits in just like that and like that. And, he, and, and this is the knee, all right? And so you can see that if the patient had a, a increased socket flexion, increased socket flexion, what happens to the knee, y'all? I need you to put that down in the comments right now. I ain't even just going to give you the answer. I want you to look at my nice Pablo Picasso and you tell me, well, in this position where the, where the socket is more flexed, What's happening with the knee? Can y'all put that down right now on the socket? What's happening at the knee? Is it becoming more extended or is it becoming more of a flex knee? All right. And exactly that is it. We're getting more of a flex knee at this point. You can see that here. All right. So what am I saying? Well, the more socket flexion that we have, the more knee flexion that we're going to have. Y'all can see that. Okay, are we on the same page? Cool. So the question doesn't say that, though. So I want to go ahead and eliminate all that. I'm going to strike that. Okay, cool. Let's go back, and I want to draw a prosthesis now that has insufficient socket flexion. All right? And so let's draw the socket as if it was kind of back like this. And we got our little pylon and our foot. Okay, so now you can see that it's tilted back the other way, right, people? Y'all see that? We all on the same page? So I'm going to go ahead, change my color to red here, and I'm going to show you the limb now. How it's all in here, and the knee is like in this place. So I want you to tell me right now, is the knee more flexed? Or is it more extended now comparing to the, the other picture that we just drew previously? You should be saying, well, now the knee is more extended. 
right? So what I need you to remember and commit to memory is that inadequate socket flexion, meaning that it's too little of socket flexion, is going to give you this, baby. It's going to give you this. That means that the knee is going to be more extended, excessive knee extension. So if we have inadequate socket flexion, the patient is going to present with excessive knee extension. Boom. I like this answer. Makes sense. Don't know if it's the right one yet, but my Pablo Picasso makes it look like the right answer. Let's look at D as our final one. All right. D says a hip flexion contracture. All right, cool. So we're still dealing with the sagittal plane because hip flexion is sagittal. The patient has a hip flexion contracture. Is that going to promote knee extension? Well, the one thing I would expect my patient to have as a gait deviation is what? Like a forward trunk lean or something like that, right? Where they're leaning, for, they're leaning a lot forward. You know, the one thing that they may tend to do is actually try to get the foot on the ground because you got to imagine this, y'all. If you are contracted at the hip, if you had a hip flexion contracture and you kept your knee in extension, do you think your entire foot is going to be flush with the ground, be level with the ground? I mean, think about it. You might have to stand up right now and do this for yourself. If you were in hip flexion right now and you extended your full knee and put your heel down to the ground, is your full foot on the ground? Most of y'all should be saying, no, it's not, right? It's like my toes are up in the air. Here's the deal. Your patient's going to try to put that foot down to the ground. And how will they do that? By flexing at the knee. So you're not really going to see excessive knee extension here. If anything, we're going to see more flexion at the knee because we're trying to get the entire prosthetic foot down on the ground. All right. I know this is a lot of mumbo jumbo mechanics and stuff, but you need to have this understanding of how the prosthetics work in order for you to get questions like right like this with confidence. All right. So what am I really saying? D is not the right answer, baby. I would not expect excessive knee extension. I would expect some knee flexion here. All right. And so I'm ruling out. D, our final answer with certainty is C, inadequate socket flexion. For those of you who got this question correct, congratulations. This one was not easy, baby. It wasn't easy, but I'm proud of you. So congratulations.